Okay, good morning and welcome to today's Finance Committee hearing. My name is Councilmember Daniel Drum and I'm the chair of the committee. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We have been joined by Councilmember Barry Gudenchik, uh, others will be, and Councilmember Powers. Uh, today the committee will be hearing two pieces of <coughs> legislation relating to payment agreements for people who owe property tax arrears. The first is proposed intro number 1143, sponsored by myself and Councilmember Yeager by request of the mayor. This bill will establish three new types of income-based installment agreements available to lower income homeowners where the property is their primary residence. The second piece of legislation is a pre-considered intro sponsored by, by myself to authorize the Banking Commission to recommend in the Council to adopt a property tax late payment interest rate that would be applicable to certain properties that are subject to an installment agreement where such agreement is current. Before I describe the bills in more detail, I want to thank the Department of Finance for working together with the Council uh, to bring today's bills to a hearing. Uh, these pieces of legislation are a product of the 2015 Task Force on the Lean Sale, which was a joint effort between representatives of the administration and the Council. After meeting and working on the year-long Task Force, one of the final recommendations was to create ways to minimize the number of properties in the Lean Sale by allowing for affordable payment plans, lower interest rates, and flexibility when property owners work in good faith with the City uh, to address their debt. This hearing has therefore been several years in the making, and I want to commend the Commissioner, in particular, uh, for his leadership and advocacy on this issue. These programs are the first of their kind in the city, and they're going to help a lot of people who are struggling to pay their rising tax bills, property tax bills. Jumping into the specifics of the plans, currently, when a property owner owes property tax arrears, they can enter into an installment agreement with DOF in order to pay back the amount owed over time. These installment agreements will withdraw the property from an upcoming lien sale and can be entered into for a period of up to 10 years with as little as zero dollars in down payment. But the amount of each installment is calculated without regard to income or ability to pay and property owners must remain current on all property taxes as they accrue. Moreover, interest continues to accrue on the unpaid amounts at the same rate of interest as they did prior to the execution of the agreement. As a result, many property owners cannot actually afford the payments on the agreements and end up defaulting, which bars them from entering into another payment plan for at least five years. According to the Department of Finance, the default rate in 2018 was 46.5%, meaning that nearly half of the people in installment agreements could not afford to keep up with them. In an effort to bring down the default rate and help home homeowners stay current on their payment plans, and out of the lien sale, intro number 1143 will establish three new installment agreements available to homeowners who earn $50,000 or less a year, own a class one, one to three family home, or a class two condo, and use the home as their primary place of residence. The three new agreements will be as followed. One, a senior installment agreement that allows seniors to defer a percentage or all of their property tax payments until death or the transfer of the property. Two, an income-based installment agreement that would allow eligible homeowners to make payments based on a percentage of their income for however long it takes to pay off their debt. And three, an extenuating circumstances installment agreement that would allow a homeowner with an extenuating circumstance, like the loss of, the jo of a job or the death of a contributing uh, household member, to pay an amount based on a percentage of their income for a year or two until they get back on their feet. The second piece of legislation, the pre-considered intro, relates to the late payment interest rates. Currently, the Banking Commission must recommend two late payment interest rates to the Council for the late payment of property taxes. One properties, uh, one properties with assessed values of more than $250,000 and one properties with assessed value of $250,000 or less. For nearly 25 years, those rates remained at 18 and 19, 19 and, excuse me, 18 and 9 percent respectively. But beginning in fiscal 2016, the Council adopted a rate lower than the 9 percent in an attempt to ease the burden on property owners who are already struggling and to bring the interest rate charged by the city more in line with interest rates charged in other contexts. For the fiscal 2019, the adopted interest rates are 18% for the higher value properties and 7% for the lower value properties. 
However, despite this lower rate, interest continues to accrue more quickly than homeowners can pay, leading to a higher overall amount of payment over time and contributing to the high default rate on installment agreements. Moreover, all tax arrears owed to the city accrue interest at the same rate regardless of whether the property owner is making a good faith effort to address the debt by entering into an installment agreement with the city or whether the property owner is taking no steps to pay the city what is owed. Therefore, this pre-considered intro would require the Banking Commission to recommend and allow the Council to adopt a lower interest rate that would be applicable to properties with an assessed value of $250,000 or less that is subject to a valid payment agreement plan with DOF. This will create a greater incentive for people to enter into late payment plans and help them stay current on those plans so that they can successfully resolve their debt. Responsible homeowners who engage with the city to pay the money they owe should be rewarded for their efforts. This bill will accomplish that while still ensuring that the city collects all the property taxes it is due and that any, and that any costs associated with the deferred payments are covered. The committee looks forward to hearing from the commissioner on both of these bills and to continue to work with him and his team to assist property owners with addressing their property tax burdens. So before we hear from the commissioner, uh, Commissioner Jacques Gia and Deputy Commissioner Jeffrey Shear, I'd like to thank Rebecca Chasen, Stephanie Ruiz, uh, Raymond Majewski, Emra Edev, Davis Winslow, <coughs> and Mrs. Sarkissian from the Finance Division for the work in putting together today's hearing. And now we will hear from the Department of Finance after they are sworn in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes, I do. Uh, good morning, Chair Drum and uh, members of the uh, Finance Committee. I'm joined today, as you said, by Jeffrey Shear, who is the Deputy Commissioner of Treasury and Payment Services at the New York City Department of Finance. We come before you today in support of legislation that will help low-income New Yorkers and seniors who are struggling to pay the property tax taxes and are at risk of losing their homes. Insure 1143 fulfills a promise made to the Council in 2017 when we requested that the Council extend the city's tax and sales authority. At the time, we told the Council that we would design a payment plan that would take into account New Yorkers' ability to pay and thereby help them stay out of the lien cell. The legislation before you today will do exactly that with tremendous positive impacts for our most vulnerable property owners. First, let me give you some background on why these uh, new payment agreements are so necessary. In the last 10 years, property values have skyrocketed in New York City as a result of a number of factors, including record employment growth and low interest rates. While this is good news for people who are selling their properties, it is not such good news for senior citizens and homeowners living on a fixed income. These are people, these are not people looking to flip their, their houses and make money. They want to stay in their neighborhoods and continue to contribute to their community. But as neighborhoods gentrify and development accelerate, accelerates, their property values and therefore the taxes are rising while their income more or less remains the same. As a result, many vulnerable homeowners wind up in a lien cell. We know that the lien cell is an effective enforcement tool for the city. Voluntary compliance has greatly increased since its inception. Property tax delinquency has declined from an average of 4.4% to just 1.2% today. That is very important because each percentage point increase in voluntary compliance is worth about $260 million more in property tax collections. So the 3.2 percentage point difference results annually in $830 million of additional revenue to fund critical city services. But while the lien sale is effective, we want to do what we can to help seniors, single mothers, persons with disabilities, and others 
avoid becoming delinquent on their real property tax bills. That is why we have significantly increased our outreach efforts to keep property owners out of the lien sale, whether by enrolling them in payment plans or helping them apply for exemptions that can reduce the taxes and remove the properties from the lien sale. Over the past three years, we have averaged a total of about uh, 3,900 liens are sold, compared to an average of about 5,000 in the preceding three years, a decrease of 22%. As you know, on the existing uh, tax law, <clears throat> the Department of Finance offers a payment agreement that allows property owners who are behind on their property taxes to put as little as zero down and make payments of their delinquent taxes for a term of up, up to 10 years. However, the agreements require that owners pay all of their newly incurred charges as they come due each quarter, which is difficult for many property owners. For example, the median tax bill for a homeowner in 2017 was $4,447. While a homeowner may only have to pay a couple of hundred dollars each quarter for the delinquent taxes, he or she must also pay an additional $1,100 per quarter to keep current. For some property owners, these requirements are hard to meet, which leads some to default on the agreements. Once an owner defaults on a payment plan agreement, he or she is ineligible for a new agreement for five years unless there are extenuating circumstances such as a job loss or a death in the family, or unless the owner somehow manages to pay 20% of the total amount owed. Given the high default rate, a growing number of property owners are claiming extenuating circumstances for, the, for their defaulted agreement so that they may receive another agreement and keep the property out of the tax cell. Basically, it all adds up to this. New York City homeowners need relief, and this legislation will provide assistance to taxpayers who are experiencing hardship in paying their property taxes. The legislation creates three new payment plans that take into account homeowners' income and ability to pay. The plans will be available to condo and class one homeowners and seniors who earn $50,000 or less. The new payment plans will allow homeowners not only to extend the repayment of the delinquent taxes, but to defer a portion of the current taxes until the home is sold or transferred to a new owner, at which point the city will collect with interest. In essence, the unpaid property taxes will be deferred, but not forgiven. The deferral amount is limited to 25% of the homeowner equity for class one properties and 50% equity for condos. Interest on the unpaid property taxes will continue to accrue as a, at 7% as established by current local law. Here is a summary of the three payment plans in the new legislation. The first one is the low income senior plan which will allow seniors to age in their homes. In order to qualify, class one and condo owners must be 65 or older, earn less than $50,000, and reside in the property for at least one year. The taxpayer can choose to make monthly or quarterly payments of 0%, 25, 50, or 75% of back and prospective taxes. The second plan, is a fixed rent income based plan, which is for homeowners who face short term financial difficulties. They must earn less than $50,000 and have resided at the property for at least one year. The homeowner can make monthly or quarterly payments of 2, 4, 6, or 8% of their income to pay back taxes plus a one year worth of current charges. The third plan is the Extenuating Circumstances Income-Based Plan, 
which is for homeowners who meet the Department of Finance legal definition of extenuating circumstances. This includes the death or serious illness of the owner or an immediate family member, loss of income due to unemployment or enrollment in the Department of Environmental Protection's Water Debt Assistance Program. Applicants must earn less than $50,000 and have resided at the property for at least one year. They can choose to pay 2, 4, 6, or 8% of their income to pay back taxes and current charges for as long as the extenuating circumstances persist. The, deferral, uh, the tax deferral is capped at 25% of their equity in the property. We expect the new plans will be a more realistic options for people who are house rich but cash poor and have trouble paying the property taxes. We will market them aggressively by including information in our notices and bills. We will seek traditional and social media publicity and we will host a series of outreach events throughout all five boroughs, including having joint sessions with council members and other elected officials. It is important to note that these payment agreements will not affect city revenues. Since the city accounts on an accrual basis, only cash flow will be impacted. Based on the experiences of other localities with similar programs, we estimate that the total amount of property taxes that will be deferred over a 10-year period will be approximately $14 million. We will collect the deferred property taxes via property closings or as a last resort via the tax and sale process if the homeowner defaults on the agreement. Furthermore, the city's interest is protected by limiting the tax default amount to 25% of the owner's equity. In summary, this legislation is a win for everyone. The city will continue to collect the property taxes that fund its core services, while New Yorkers with limited means will be able to stay in their homes and the neighborhoods they love. We thank the council for all you have done to help us reduce the number of homeowners in the lean cell and to reach the people and communities who need our help. Today, we ask you to join us in support of Intro 1143. Thank you, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, we appreciate your testimony, you coming in and working with us on this important piece of legislation. Uh, let me just start off by saying currently the department offers a payment plan that is zero money down for up to 10 years, but without consideration of the property owner's ability to pay. How many of these payment plans are currently active? I think we have an inventory of 3,400. 30, 30, 30, 30, yeah. yeah. And how can homeowners enter into installment agreements that are currently available? Do they do that in person or do they do it online? How does that work? Currently, they have to go to one of our business centers uh, to apply for one. Uh, ultimately, we will move our application electronically so they could do it online. Do you know when that will be up? We are currently working on it. Yeah, so we, are, we, we are about to launch our new property tax system sometimes in January. Okay. The day after we will work on it. So January? After, after January. After January, yeah. okay. Uh, will all the methods and locations for enrollment into the current plans also exist for enrollment into these new agreements? Yes. So they're all there, okay. All right, now you're proposing three different payment plans, one for seniors, uh, one for property owners with extenuating circumstances and one for a fixed period of time. How many properties do you estimate will participate in each of these payment programs each year? Uh, at this moment in time, we don't have a, you know, a good sense of how many people will participate in the program, but uh, you know, we, uh, we, were looking, we are looking into this to know, to have a better sense. But it, it's what I call parameter driven. It depends on uh, our, on outreach efforts. The uh, more outreach we do, the more people we could reach. And I think after the first year, we'll have a better sense of how many people would register. But so far, we think probably going to be in line with what we have done historically. Do you have an idea about how much tax revenue would be deferred? Uh, so we, as I said in my testimony, we're looking over a 10-year period of about $14 million. 
14 million, that's yeah. what right, exactly. Um, do you have a fiscal estimate for this bill? Uh, technically, it's not going to cause the city any, uh, it's not going to have any fiscal impact on the city's revenue because, as I said, the city accounting is uh, based on accrual accounting. So it's uh, not when the tax revenue is, it's when the tax is accrued, not when it's, you know, when the money comes into the city. So it's going to have a cash flow, but not a, a revenue per se on the city's revenue. Mm -hmm. Um, do taxpayers have to be in default to enter into the agreement, or can mm -hmm. they be used to address like future taxes? Uh, hopefully, we don't want people to be in default. It's like if you know for sure you're going to have some financial difficulties, it is an option for you before you get into a default position. Um, can you describe the steps and the paperwork a property owner would have to uh, do in order to enroll in the programs? Well, let me defer to uh, Jeff, who's uh, involved uh, more or less in the day-to-day -day administration of the plan. But so far, it, it's not going to be different, much more different than what we currently have. It is that uh, because of uh, uh, it requires a lot more work because uh, the underwriting is going to be different than because it's linked to the property now. So therefore, we have to more or less follow a different sort of underwriting procedure. But uh, that is, we, are, we have to look at the value of the property, estimate the value of the property, see how much equity that the uh, property owners, uh, property owner has in the property. And so all this is going to require some work, but I would defer to Jeff. Just before we move to detail. that, will you be able to provide any in-person assistance? Oh, yes. Yes. The, the homeowners, okay. Yes, yes. Yes, so we plan to have the intake at our five business centers in each of the boroughs. We plan to have, as the commissioner said, a relatively easy application form, um, but we will have to do a little bit of work when it comes to verifying income and also verifying um, the equity in the property. So we will be asking people once they've cleared the first hurdle to um, have a title search report so we fully understand all of the um, potential liabilities against the property um, to calculate that. Um, we also are currently working on what we're calling a payment terms calculator so that when people do come in, they can see in advance what the full terms are of the agreement, which is something that, frankly, we're not doing such a good job of right now. So they can see based upon what portion of their income that they would be paying um, over what period of time, what the monthly payment would be, uh, etc. So that is something that they would get immediate imp um, input from us on, and we will um, likely ask them to sign a printout of that just to make sure they understand what they're getting into. Um, but we will have some um, back office verification of the income and the um, the equity. equity in the property. How do you determine that? The equity in the property. So the, the equity in the property would be, we're going to be using the DOF determined value of the property, um, since that's readily available to us. And then we are going to, from the title report, look at um, mortgages or liens, or the liens. Uh, anything, any liabilities to be subtracted from, from the value. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you mentioned in your testimony, Commissioner, about outreach and that being important. So what is the plan to do outreach at this point? Well, uh, that's something we're going to aggressively pursue. As you know, we have a very aggressive uh, outreach campaign at the uh, DOF, working with all elected officials. So we will continue that kind of outreach with elected officials and other communities. But we will also include uh, in all of our notices all our, of our bills. So we have the tax licenses, not this one sense, like the 90 days, 60 days, 45 days, and so on. So every correspondence we're going to have, we're going to try to uh, uh, include information about the program. We will also engage uh, um, uh, what I call uh, the traditional media as well as social media. Okay, a very aggressive campaign again to reach as many people. We'll also go in different ethnic, uh, work with different ethnic media. Uh, go in different ethnic communities basically to make sure they are aware of uh, the program. So our goal is we are working on a very aggressive campaign. Our outreach team is here and they will provide you more detailed campaign but uh, for now we're working on a very aggressive campaign that we could share with you uh, as uh, we begin to implement the program. 
Will you work with um, other organizations or agencies? Oh, uh, definitely. Promoted as well? Oh, definitely, yes. Um, can the DOF use information it collects from payment plan applications to automatically enroll homeowners in exemption and abatement programs they are eligible for? For example, she, uh, or if not, um, how can uh, DOF help taxpayers uh, who are eligible for exemptions sign up for them? Uh, I would not automatically enroll people because I would let you know taxpayers make their own decision whether or not they want to take you know, because this is a loan technically technically you know uh, so I would let them make their own decision but however as I said we would try to use every single opportunity that we have to reach out to people who are struggling to pay the property taxes to make sure that they are fully aware of, uh, of uh, the program uh, we are also as you know, we do a very aggressive campaign to make sure that taxpayers take advantage of all the exemption programs that we have, because this is, from our perspective, one way of ensuring that uh, uh, property taxes in New York is, is in a more or less affordable, affordable to a lot of our, uh, taxpayers. So uh, we'll continue to aggressively you know, uh, uh, um, market these uh, uh, programs to uh, the taxpayers as much as we can. Um, the current um, maximum incomes for uh, she and DHE is about 58000 um, and the state's enhanced star program has an income limit of about 74000 74, So can you tell us how you arrived at the $50,000 um, limit? The 50000 I mean, the she and the all the programs that we have, the maximum benefits that you uh, secure is at 50000 After 50000 you continue to get benefits, but they phase out. Over, you know, the benefit phase out after fifty thousand or to fifty-eight thousand dollars. So uh, our goal was to find the maximum point, you know, and then match it to make sure we're consistent across all of our programs. Would DOF be supportive of indexing the threshold to some measure of inflation or median income in the city? Well, this is something we could look in the future once we once we have the. Uh, uh, um, infrastructure in place because as you can imagine it's going to be a little complicated in terms of uh, ensuring that on an annual basis we have to adjust uh, the threshold so again as I say I'm open to that kind of discussion but to begin with we have to start by having an infrastructure that we can handle to begin with once we do we'll be open to this kind of discussion so um, all these programs are income uh, restricted and uh, they'll be checked on an, uh, on an annual basis Yes. Um, and so if a homeowner goes over the $50,000 in any given year, what would happen uh, to a taxpayer in the payment plan that experiences, uh, like, let's say, a one-time windfall in terms of income? Well, that's um, it, currently the way we design the program. Once you reach $50,000, you're technically out of the program. And I have to think about it because of uh, that issue of uh, if you have a one-time increase in income and you come right back to it because this is some something that we dealt with with the she program we addressed that issue because that was a technical problem for us again i would we could come back to you with looking into in terms of it is a one time uh uh, uh spike in income and your income comes back to the normal flow but currently the way we have it once your income exceeds fifty thousand dollars you will be out of the program in other words you're not going to be forced to pay you're still going to be in a plan, but you're not going to take advantage. Uh, well, like of, if somebody gets a, a life insurance policy, yeah, that's or we, as I said, we have to we have to look into this okay. this aspect. Like we did for she and Z, we had the we had a similar problem with she and Z, which we address. Squee, 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 squee injury. So similarly, if a property owner misses the renewal deadline to renew the hardship payment uh, plan, will there be any flexibility to allow them to re-enter the installment agreement? Again, uh, we will look into these issues, um, um, but you know, currently we have a dead, what is the deadline we have right now? We, we haven't set up a deadline now, per se. Right. We haven't set up a deadline at this point in time, okay. uh, in terms of a fixed date. We don't we don't have that yet. I think our goal is to make sure uh, we uh, we continue to renew. The purpose of the renewal program is that we could uh, obtain information about the income on an annual basis to see the person still qualified, but I don't think we have a date yet. In the I don't think in the law we have a specific date. After January 2019. After January 2019, okay.
So can you just repeat that in the mic so we can get it? So, go ahead. It applies to agreements entered into after January 2019. So it applies to agreements after January? 2019. 2019. That's, that's what you have in the run Okay. In the decision? That's the effective date. The effective date is January 2019. But I think the question was uh, what happened if you want to renew? Do we have an effective date for renewal in the legislation? Or is it rolling? Or is it rolling? Yeah. Oh, we'll get back to you. We'll get back to you on this. Okay, um, let me just talk a little bit about the pre-considered intro that would require the Banking Commission to recommend and allow the Council to adopt an interest rate that would be applicable to tax arrears for properties that are subject to a current installment agreement. This interest rate must be at least equal to the most recently determined federal short-term rate, most recently set at about 2.5%, which is commonly understood to represent the rate at which a short-term borrowing could be achieved in the unlikely instance that the city would have to borrow to cover the cost of these deferred payments. Uh, while I understand that you're still reviewing the details of the bill, I'd like to ask you generally about the concept of the bill. Does the administration view the interest rate as a penalty for late payment or as a way to cover the cost of non or deferred payment? Uh, the, way I'm, the way I look at it is, uh, as, as, uh, I'm as concerned as you uh, with respect to adding any undue burden on the taxpayers. So therefore, we always look for ways. That's the reason why we come up with uh, the new plans that uh, we uh, introduce in the legislation. But the challenge that we have is, as you know, um, the reduction in the rate would have a significant impact on uh, tax revenue. Okay. So, from my perspective, this is not something we should analyze in isolation. We should look at it in the context of a budget negotiation or discussion rather than just isolate it. That's what, you know, at this point in time, that's the way I would characterize it from my perspective. Do you have an estimate of the fiscal impact of the, leg of the legislation? Uh, we're still working on it. But you also have to look at it not just from a property tax perspective, but in terms of the water authority, because they are forced to basically adopt the same weight that we are using. So the impact may not be as much on us, but for them it will be significant because if they have to, uh, that interest rate has to be used for all, for everyone, not just for a segment, small segment. So from their perspective, it could be very high. Okay, I'm gonna let some council members ask questions. Uh, council member Helen Rosenthal. Thank you, Chair Drum. Uh, these are great things, great work you're doing, so thank you. Thank you. Um, but I'm still going to just ask a quick question. Um, do you have a, do you know the spread between what it costs the city to borrow money compared to what we will now be charging? Uh, I don't have that information from the top of my head, but I could provide you that information. Do you have a guess? Yeah. Again, as I said, it depends on, you know, which, you know, timing is different, you know, cap, you know capital market changes daily for long-term capital. So um, I don't have... I'm just wondering... I, I don't have something in my, you know, on top of my head. Okay. But I could provide you that information. Sure, sure. Um... Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, good. And I, I forgot to announce that uh, we were joined by council members Powers, Rosenthal, Mario, Moya, and Cornegy. So thank, thank you Chair. all for coming. And now we've been joined by uh, council member Van Bramer. Uh, let me just go back. I have some questions about water bills. Um, does entering into one of these payment plans address taxpayer issues with water and sewer charges? And how can taxpayers be sure they are up to date on? all of their property related charges no this is has nothing to do with uh, water and sewer it's a separate uh, as you know it's a separate entity is there water a way that the taxpayer can check uh that they're up to date on all of their payments that are owed to the city i'm sorry I, can you repeat that? sure is is there a way that um taxpayers can be sure that they're up to date on all their property related charges how can they find out that information um, they can find out that information um, online or at, at our business centers. Is it all on, on one, at one site, one address? 
um, for are you including the water charges? Yeah. Um, so right now it is not. No, the DEP runs a, a separate system. Um, okay, a lot of constituents do see it as the same. Yes, yeah, we, know, we, we understand. But, but it's, uh, one is an authority which is independent of uh, the city per se, so that is always a challenge. So did you reach out to DEP at all to see if they're willing to offer a similar hardship plan? They have a hardship plan. They have a yeah, so um, DEP has the Water Debt Assistance Program, um, which we do refer to in the testimony. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, participation in that program um, would allow people to get um, th the um, extenuating circumstances plan that we talk about. So that's one of the triggers for uh, us accepting them. So if DEP has given uh, in effect, their version of, of a hardship plan, um, and if the um, homeowner meets the income qualifications, then they would be eligible for um, our plan. How do you coordinate that with DEP? Uh, when someone applies with us, we, we will be checking with DEP. Uh, are you reviewing DEP payment data to get a sense of who might benefit from those programs? Um, it, I'm sorry, could you be a little sure, more specific? Sure, are you specific? reviewing DEP payment data to get a sense of who might be eligible for these programs that we're talking uh, about today? Uh, we have not done it. Have not. We, uh, our focus has been on creating the policy. The will that be something you But that's once we have, once we put the administration in place, Moving yeah, forward. That would be one of the things that, that we'll be looking into. We, we would definitely use that as um, to create our marketing plan and, and know who we want to do outreach towards. Okay, so um, as written, uh, the installment agreements will be available to Class 1 and Class 2 condo owners. So what is DOF's uh, position on expanding the eligibility to small Class 2 buildings, such as those who may live in what is categorized as a 4 uh, unit building, um, but is used as a one-family or two-family home. Uh, currently, we don't have them because in 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 mine, um, and again because the the focus has been on trying to protect homeowners uh, with uh, income of less than fifty thousand dollars. As you know, many of these properties are technically classified as commercial under <laughs> current classification right now. So we still would like to discuss that four to six family owner occupied situation with you as well. We could discuss. They might just fall outside of uh, the legislation that we're discussing. Sure. Um, our, our staff shared with you a report from the California Legislative Analyst Office that reviewed the state's program of deferred payments for low payment for low income seniors. One of the findings was that the state, which charges a seven percent non compounded rate earned a profit on these programs, which presumably the city would make as well. That report also cited the relatively high 7% interest rate as a potential explanation for the low usage of that state's program. Do you believe that a lower rate would encourage enrollment and usage of these assistant programs? Um, again, um, I don't know if these are price sensitive uh, per se. Uh, these programs so that, uh, you know, it's an inference you would make to say, you know, if you lower the interest with more people participate. Based on our own experiences, when people are having trouble paying their property taxes, they are about to go into a lien sale. That's when they are looking for a payment plan to get out of the lien sale. So, I, you know, I'm, I haven't seen any evidence, any study that basically link interest rate with participation in this kind of program. But again, you know, I wouldn't make, uh, to me, that would be a uh, speculation on my part to argue that there is a correlation between the two. Um, how soon after um, a tax payment is missed um, are homeowners notified um, of that? They are notified in their next bill. Um, so typically that would be their, the quarterly statement of account. Um, and for this plan, we um, plan to offer quarterly or monthly um, bills, so we would be notifying them um, at the time of the next bill.
I think we are um, done with this portion. I want to thank you for coming in and giving testimony. We look forward to uh, putting the finishing touches on this piece of legislation. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you again for coming in. I'd now like to call up Arthur Bur uh, Burkle uh, from Legal Services New York City, uh, Oda Friedheim, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, uh, from the Legal Aid Society, Leo Goldberg from the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, and um, Ravi Orzo, Ozo. Okay, thank you all for coming in. Uh, would you like to start over there? Okay, fine. Okay, that's fine. Okay, very good. Good morning. My name is Leo Goldberg. I am Policy and Research Manager at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum and the committee uh, for holding today's hearing. Uh, the center works with LMI homeowners. Uh, we coordinate foreclosure prevention and housing counseling, and we have a foreclosure prevention loan program called the Mortgage Assistance Program that, in addition to uh, helping homeowners with tax arrears, uh, also helps people with, uh, uh, sorry, in addition to mortgage arrears, helps homeowners with tax arrears. Uh, and the program uh, looks similar to the senior deferred option, so we have some experience in this. Um, in this area. Um, so I, I'll just briefly say uh, we are really pleased that the council is taking this up. Um, this is an area that we think is vitally important. There are tens of thousands of uh, lower income homeowners who experience really severe tax burdens. Um, you may have seen a report uh, from the comptroller's office recently that found that uh, lower income homeowners have much higher tax burdens as a proportion of their income uh, than higher income people, and this is a result of the property tax system and tax caps, etc. cetera. Um, but the result is that the lower income you have as a homeowner, uh, regardless of the value in your property, uh, the greater strain you have. Uh, we did a survey of homeowners in East New York last year, and we found that only 18% reported that they were able to save any money uh, after paying all their bills with the rest either breaking even or drawing on credit cards or other debt just to meet regular expenses. So there's a really widespread level of financial um, precariousness in the city. Um, and we think that this is one good step towards uh, helping folks address that. So that said, um, we think that in some of the specifics of the bill, uh, there's some work to be done to make sure that's as effective as possible. Um, and that it is providing the assistance that it sets out to do. So I'm, I have more detail in the testimony, and I know um, the folks around me are going to go into more detail as well, so I'll do kind of a high-level overview of some of the areas we think could be improved. Um, so one is reducing barriers in the application and renewal process, and I think um, the Chair's questions got at some of this, but uh, Assuming that uh, applicants are going to be able to take on a title search and some of the other requirements, um, 
could be could be problematic. Even though with the title search requirement, there is uh, an option that the DOF does it on behalf of the homeowner um, and is reimbursed, even um, the requirement on the face of the application might be discouraging to a number of homeowners. We have to assume that a lot of people um, are already in a, a financial strain and perhaps other strains in their life when they're going to this application process and really making this as simple as possible with as few barriers as possible is going to be really important and something like hiring someone to do a title search can be um, can be really discouraging. Uh, another piece would be um, the requirement that all owners on the property sign the application. Um, we'd hope to see some kind of exemption to that requirement. There's a lot of people with complicated family situations um, and we need some acknowledge of that in uh, the application process here. Um, and then the chair's questions got at a point that I think is really crucial, which is the requirement that their annual renewals of the application, especially for seniors. We imagine that many seniors would drop out of the program accidentally. DOF has a lot of sources of data that it could draw on to verify the ongoing eligibility of, of these homeowners in the program, especially if it was brought in line with SHE um, or the Enhanced STAR program. So you could link it closer to these existing exemption programs, cross-reference, and make sure um, that homeowners are eligible in that way. Um, we also have some concerns about the net equity requirement. Uh, while I understand why it's useful in the senior case, I actually don't understand why it's useful for the non-senior options and would exclude um, some homeowners that otherwise could uh, be helped by the program. Uh, and then coming back to the income eligibility question, like I said, I think it would make sense to bump up the income eligibility for the seniors up to the other programs that exist. Um, and we looked at application data to the New York Mortgage Assistance Program for non-seniors looking for help with their tax liens. And we found that 42% of the applicants uh, were above $50,000 in income. So there is demand for this exact kind of help um, above that 50000 threshold, and I think we should really consider raising it. The city is going to get this tax revenue back eventually. It's a well-structured program. There will be a lien on the property. Um, so why not raise the income to, to meet uh, the need where it is? And I should say the, the New York MAP program is going to be fully subscribed in the spring. So um, these measures like these are going to be really important to fill that hole. Um, and just the last couple uh, notes I would make is uh, this points to an issue with the broader property tax system that we hope that the council uh, takes on as well, um, which these installment plans will help people once they're already in trouble. Um, we would also hope to see stronger provisions that link people's property taxes to their incomes um, before they're in trouble. So that might look like circuit breaker breakers, um, homesteading exemptions to make sure that uh, a homeowner in a gentrifying neighborhood isn't priced out of their home or put in a situation where they need to come to DOF for help um, just because of the circumstances around their property. A lot of cities in the U.S. have um, systems like this, circuit breaker exemptions, etc., cetera, um, and we should really uh, look at that more. And, and finally, um, notice, and especially if uh, someone is exiting the installment plan agreement uh, or, or at risk of defaulting on it, um, it's really critical um, to, to provide a serious level of notice. Uh, we see this with our clients and our partners' clients all the time that just because a letter is sent to someone telling them uh, that they're behind on a bill does not mean that they're going to read that or understand it. Um, so uh, housing counselors, legal services, um, having people ready to assist these homeowners is going to be really key. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to testify, and um, thank you for advancing this legislation. Just quick before we go to the next person, um, what's the cost today for a title search, approximately? I don't oh. know. I think four, four, five hundred thousand, five hundred, five hundred approximately. That much? No. Okay. Yeah. And um, what would be the suggested level to raise um, the eligibility at level two? It's fifty-eight thousand something for the um, right. for scree, I guess, um, in D. Uh, did you make a suggestion? I, I think for the seniors, raising it to the she level 
would be good. We could also raise it to the enhanced star level. I'm not sure what the city loses in doing that, which is um, higher. <laughs> don't actually have it in front of me. 74,000. 74, 74, and for the Non-seniors, I think we could do the same. Um, there, there's plenty of folks who need help in that income range, and like I said, the revenue's all coming to the city. So. Okay, thank you. Next, please. All right. Good morning. Uh, my name is Oda Friedham. Yes, you didn't mangle my name. Uh, and uh, I rep I, I'm speaking today on behalf of the Legal Aid Society. Um, we have uh, been involved in foreclosure prevention since uh, actually 2000. Um, and in the last many years, we have particularly dealt with uh, many senior homeowners that uh, actually had uh, incredible burdens in terms of property taxes and uh, also water and sewer charges. So we are very familiar with some of these issues, and therefore, we really welcome and commend the City Council for taking this important step to create a program that would be both flexible and uh, income-based. We think that is a very, very significant step and would certainly assist uh, many homeowners. And we certainly appreciate uh, the Department of Finance uh, recognition of the problem, which has not always been the case, and we really see this as you know a significant step in the right direction. Now, based on our uh, experience with uh, especially senior homeowners, but just generally low-income homeowners, including low-income condo owners. We practice in the Bronx, and we represent many people, for example, in the Parkchester condominiums, as well as others. Uh, so, um, based on our experience, we do have uh, concerns similar to basically what Leo Goldberg already articulated. Uh, which is that some of the uh, requirements would be both burdensome and possibly exclude exactly those homeowners that need it the most. Uh, I would say, uh, as Leo already mentioned, you know, if, if a homeowner sees the word title report, I think they're going to run in the opposite direction because they're really title report, that is a very legal, abstract concept. That's not something that your typical homeowner would actually understand to even, uh, I think the city, if, if in fact a title report is necessary, then that's uh, something that the city should automatically take on. Uh, it's not even clear to us why it's so important. It, it became clear during, I believe, the testimony of the commissioner that it's to basically get to a net equity amount rather than, uh, you know, we're not clear where the lien would actually be placed. Would it be uh, after existing mortgages or that's not very clear from the uh, legislation. In any event, uh, I think title report, if indeed necessary, should be done by the city automatically and uh, as, as part of the application process. Uh, ditto for appraisals for condos. Uh, and um, then I also want to address the issue, which is another requirement that, and, and Leo touched on that, um, that all homeowners, all property owners sign onto the application. Well, that is probably one of the thorniest issues. And we don't have ready answers to that. We understand the, the idea behind it, but there's got to be a more flexible approach. I mean, what we, we see many variations. It's not just complicated family relations. There are issues of domestic violence, uh, you know, where you know, the, the perpetrator of the violence is obviously not going to cooperate, in fact, cannot cooperate. So uh, in addition, uh, as part of past predatory practices, there were many instances where, unfortunately, brokers push people into recruiting co-signers who never had an intention to live there to get on the deed and also uh, you know, uh, take on the note and mortgage. So uh, there's many variations on this theme, but there's, there's got, that's going to be a big, big hurdle. And that's going to be uh, definitely uh, addressed. Uh, and you know, we, we would be happy to you know, work with the city council on figuring out ways to deal with that. Um, and as uh, Leo already said, the renewal, of course, is, is another thing that is burdensome. I think our experience is really uh, grounded in the fact that the many seniors that come to our office, sometimes with mortgage problems, but often with tax problems, 
first thing I do is I check, well, you are over such and such age, you're over 65, and your income is such and such, are you already getting uh, the senior homeowner exemption, she? I'm telling you, 90% are not. We then go and have to fill out an application. So in terms of even, before we even get into this really uh, overall good plan, there's got to be, I don't know, a different kind of outreach to seniors because the problem is that the events that the Department of Finance uh, arranges, um, the, the more vulnerable homeowners, unfortunately, do not find out about it, do not come to it, and therefore are not often able to avail themselves of, you know, she, similar with DRE, the disability uh, program. So back to, you know, what is being proposed here in terms of this, uh, these payment plans, uh, we were glad to hear that the commissioner spoke about aggressive outreach, but somehow it still often falls short of reaching exactly those homeowners that are most in need, which are often seniors, they're often uh, bedridden or homebound, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, we would certainly like to cooperate in any shape we can to reach uh, such homeowners, but that is still a, a, an open issue. Um, Finally, uh, and I think Leo touched on that too, the notice requirement, that it's not addressed in the bill, but there has to be uh, some very clear uh, notices and they have to be obviously very uh, easily to be understood and so on and so on. So in short, we see some concerns based on our practice, but we still overall commend the city council for taking this really important step. Thank you very much for allowing us to testify today. Thank you very much. Next, please. Good morning. Good morning, uh, members of the City Council and Chair Drum. Thank you for inviting us to testify this morning. My name is Arthur Burkle. I'm a staff attorney in the Foreclosure Prevention and CD Unit at Bronx Legal Services, which is a program of Legal Services NYC. Um, like my colleague, uh, Ms. Friedhand uh, at Legal Aid, LSNYC is the largest or one of the largest uh, providers of free civil legal services in the country with offices in all five boroughs. Um, we've assisted over 12,000 homeowners uh, since 2009 in foreclosures in uh, discriminatory lending and abusive mortgage servicing uh, actions. Um, and we have an informed perspective on the challenges that homeowners face in all aspects of the judicial foreclosure process, um, including tax foreclosures. And we're also particularly sensitive to the needs of uh, large numbers of low and moderate income homeowners who confront a range of legal issues whom we may not be able to assist because the need outstrips the available resources. And as has already been uh, mentioned by my colleagues, uh, we commend the efforts of the committee and the Department of Finance to create this legislation which will uh, help many homeowners in need. However, we also have reservations about the current wording and the design of the law of the proposed legislation, which I go into detail in my paper testimony. Uh, and I'd like to just go over some uh, basic uh, overview of those issues. Um, as has already been mentioned, we are concerned that it, there are significant barriers to entry into the program. Again, the uh, title search requirement is onerous for homeowners who are already behind on their property taxes, while the Department of Finance can add this cost to their debt to be repaid that sort of defeats the purpose of assisting the homeowner when you're increasing the debt, which will accrue interest. Um, again, um, the requirement that all property owners sign on to the application can be difficult when some may be unavailable, some may be deceased. This current wording um, in the legislation does not provide for property successors and heirs that could participate if the original property owner is no longer um, there. Another uh, issue is that the income limit uh, does not account for the property's location. I echo uh, the uh, chair's concern that um, it would be more reasonable for the income limit to be set to area median income since income can vary widely across our city. 
it would also make more sense to uh, set the income level according to the number of property owners. It doesn't really make sense for one property owner to be bound to 50% uh, $50,000 as well as three property owners, which we've seen, um, you know, their income would be necessarily higher uh, and they shouldn't be barred just because of that arbitrary limit. Um, we're also concerned about the net equity requirement um, for that requires that the uh, liens not exceed 25 or 50 percent of the property's net equity. This is also concerning for senior citizens who may have um, taken out a reverse mortgage. A reverse mortgage is a mortgage that takes out of the equity of the property. Um, and their expenses, the payments that the senior makes, are taxes, are property taxes and insurance. If the senior is now barred from participating in this program because their reverse mortgage took out more equity, that's one of the people that this bill is intending to help who would be excluded. Another issue um, is generally to facilitate participation. Again, I echo my colleagues' concerns that an annual requirement, an annual renewal requirement is very onerous, especially for senior citizens. Um, there's also an inherent conflict between the, re the net equity requirement and the strict income limit. On one hand, a homeowner is limited by the income. They cannot earn more than $50,000. On the other hand, if the net equity of the liens is above 50 or 25 percent, they're barred. A homeowner would be incentivized to earn more money to pay down the net equity, but then they would be excluded because they earn more than $50,000. That is a conflict that we don't see it has to be there. There doesn't have to be a net equity limit uh, because even homes who are uh, underwater should be able to participate in this program. That's a homeowner that is very vulnerable, that is likely behind on property taxes, that the city is losing money out on, um, and will be automatically excluded because of the net equity requirement. Doesn't seem to serve a purpose for the DOF either. Um, it again seems that the approach after the default is punitive in that uh, once a homeowner has defaulted on an installment plan for whatever reason, uh, in order to cure that default, they have to pay 20% of the uh, liens. But these liens include water and sewer charges and other liens, whereas the initial uh, program is only for tax arrears. So now they're having to pay 20% of a potentially much larger chunk of debt that wasn't part of the original installment plan. And now if they are not able to cure, then they'll be barred for five years. Here's a homeowner who has been punished because they weren't able to make an installment plan to begin with, who then had to make a much larger payment and now will, will, not, be able, will not be eligible for five years. They will likely go through tax foreclosure. Um, another concern that we flagged was the, re the provision allowing the Department of Finance to f record installment plans with ACRIS. Um, that should be eliminated altogether. It doesn't seem to serve a purpose for the Department of Finance or for homeowners. It's already a fact that um, tax property liens are in first position. Um, they would not be um, subordinated in the case of a tax foreclosure. Um, however, filing this installment plan with ACRIS exposes the homeowner to potential harm from scammers who can search for these agreements. Property tax records are public, but they're not searchable. But filing these kinds of agreements on ACRIS would make them searchable to third parties. Um, an example of how this could play out is in our testimony in which uh, we illustrate an example. Um, a predatory investor can learn of a recent installment plan through ACRIS can target the apparent non-resident heirs of a d distressed property and persuade them to sell their interest next to nothing, then that investor could seek a partition action which has very few defenses against the homeowner who is residing in the property. That's the kind of scheme that LISNY, LSNYC has encountered multiple times, especially in Brooklyn. Um, again, uh, by filing the installment agreement on ACRIS, the mortgage servicer can become aware of the tax arrears choose to decide the tax or choose to uh, pay the tax arrears in full and then tack that on the homeowner's bill at the next mortgage bill in full, which defeats the purpose of the installment plan. Um, finally, if a homeowner is looking for an alternative of selling the property, but a potential investor sees this kind of installment agreement in ACRIS, that can frustrate those efforts. Um, We also felt that the uh, swift two-year sunset provision um, 
that uh, states that the law would take effect in January of 2019 and sunset in December 2020 is very brief. It creates uncertainty for all parties. A more reasonable lifespan would be a five-year sunset provision so that um, you know, potential participants can have security that this will be around in two years. Uh, in closing, I'd like to say that there will inevitably be hiccups um, in the rollout of an ambitious new program like this. Um, at the same time, it should be looked at more closely and it should be modified with some of the uh, issues that my colleagues and I have flagged. Um, it's impossible to foresee and provide for every situation and contingency that can arise, but um, given the Council's intention and the Department of Finance's intention in creating this program to help homeowners, these hiccups, when they arise, should be resolved with the homeowner's interest in mind and not just with the city's bottom line in mind. Thank you again for inviting us to testify this morning and uh, we would also be excited to continue working with the committee to craft a more homeowner friendly bill. Okay, thank you. Um, next please. Yeah. Hello, my name is Ralph Yazo and I'm a member of the Community Education Council in District 16 and all these things and also a computer developer, programmer, all these things that uh, our, our colleagues here are saying can be solved with software, right? A title search can be done with software, everything. The, um, and so also the payment tax history, we already created a site called tax.titleforce.org that shows the Department of Finance's history of payment and you can compare your tax payment to your neighbors. And what we see is that Queens and Staten Island are literally paying $8,000, $9,000 in tax on average, while Park Slope and Williamsburg are paying $3,000 on Class 1 property, which makes no sense whatsoever. Why are we not solving these problems? This is what's causing some of these issues, right? So I have data right here, or information right here, about the assessment ratio, right? New York City has changed this assessment ratio, which seems to be, I, I wish the department, the commissioner of finance was here, because I'd like to ask him, how has it changed from, from 18, in um, around 1980, it was 25%. It was lowered to 18% in 1985. Then it was lowered to 12% in 1989. And in 1992, the assessment ratio was lowered to 8%. And then in 2006, uh, 2004, it was lowered to 6%. What, if, we, if we compare ourselves to Nassau County, Nassau County has lowered the assessment ratio down to 0.25%. So what that would do is even out. So the people in Queens would pay the appropriate amount of tax, and the people in Park Slope and Williamsburg would pay more because, you know, their property is more valuable. And then we'd continue all these programs for seniors. We, not everyone in Park Slope is a senior. So we, we need to be more fair to, um, to our people. And, and so the law, if we read the law, New York State law says that requires the tax be based on each property's market value, but allows assessed values to be set at a fraction of the market value, but it must be uniform. We do not have a uniform rate, right? The, the people in Park Slope, Williamsburg, and probably parts of Manhattan are paying uh, uh, an assessment ratio of 1%, while the people in Queens are paying 6%. We, and, and so I suggest that we have a community budget council that because you, you guys need feedback from real people. Because I listen to the commissioner say, oh, yes, we do uh, uh, outreach, outreach. It's exactly what our colleague said here is that they do not reach the people. I walk on my block, and we're trying to get something f uh, for, you know, backyard access. So I had to talk to everybody on our block. There's people 70 years old. I said, do you live in this house? He said, yes, I've been here my all, all my life. I said, you don't have the uh, Shri or Gri or any of these programs at all. He said, really? Uh, and he, I had his son and I showed him the forms. I signed up my neighbor for Shri. Shri, she didn't know anything about it. Her son had all, all the things, but he didn't share with his mother. That So the point is we need outreach, not just, if we wait for the Department of Finance to do this stuff, they're never going to do it, 
right? They don't even, you go on their site, you can't even find out your tax history, right? We did it graphically where we show the rates and you can compare to your neighbors, you can see outliers, you can, I, I don't understand. We need to open it up to real people, programmers. I'm willing to volunteer. I talk to the borough president in Brooklyn. I volunteer to help explain tax bills. I go to the uh, advisory commission. I listen to uh, the people come up and say, the poor person came up and said, my market value went down, but my tax went up. Why? And, and nobody even answered her. It's because of the law, the way the law is written. So I could go on forever, but I'd st I'll stop just out of respect for everyone. And I wish uh, Councilperson Matteo was here because he voted against the tax increase, right? He's the only one, the only voice that said, this is outrageous. Why are we increasing taxes on, on uh, class one property? Why? It doesn't make any sense. It's backwards. We set a budget and then we tax the people uh, depending on how much we've increased the budget, right? 10%. Well, only a monopoly can do that, right? Uh, businesses can't do that. They can't just increase their budget and say, look, force the customers to pay. So we need, uh, we need the budget to be opposite, right? We need to look at what the revenue is and then set the budget, not set the budget and then uh, you know, set the revenue or force the, the monopoly taxpayers, and then we go through all these liens and things like this. It's, I, I am very disappointed in the whole system, so I just want to voice that. Thank you, Commissioner, or, or Chairman. <laughs> not, not a Commissioner. Um, yeah, uh, Chairman. That's sorry, fine. Sorry. Uh, I'm you. sure you've given testimony before the uh, tax... Um, yes, the twice, yes. Okay. And the issue is that w I don't think... There's just an advisory commission, right? So and do you think they're going to advise something? I'd like to know the history of this. If you, I would love to communicate with your office and find out who has control, because the issue I have is whoever I talk to say it's the other person. Right? So if I talk to state people, they say, oh, it's the Department of Finance. If I talk to the Department of Finance, they say it's the state. I'm so, talking about the Property Tax Reform Commission, right? Yes, I spoke okay, okay, there okay, twice. Okay. Right. But the, the thing is, this uh, Office of, of uh, Bill or Taxpayer Bill of Rights, that's another feedback. I wrote to them because we in bed bought a, a dilapidated house Right? We repaired it, and we get socked with a 125% tax increase for f repairing a building that you would think we'd be rewarded for doing that. There, Philadelphia has tax abatement programs that are automatic. You fix your house, they want you to fix houses. Here in New York City, we punish people who fix houses unless you're a developer who gets the 421A abatement and, and a 30 year, ta so they don't pay taxes for 30 years, but we're going to be in, our taxes are increased 125% forever, right? It never goes down. And nowhere in New York City do they account, uh, account for depreciation. A repair and a, an improvement are two different things. If you have a house that's just a shell and you fix it, that's not really an improvement. That's a repair of, you had to do that. You can't live in a shell with an open roof, and <coughs> right? So the law says improvement, but there has to be a distinction between improvement and repair, right? It, it's just common sense. Philadelphia does it. Everyone else. Here in New York City, you have to apply before you, you do this stuff. And how are everyone, no one knows this stuff, right? We don't know. A small, a small homeowner doesn't know that they have to apply for 421A, I, right? So... I, if you have any questions, I would love to share information with the office. I write to uh, C C uh, Councilman Ballone. I write to Matteo. I write the people that actually are voting against uh, the tax increases. But I'd love to. I've talked to Levin. I've talked to Carnegie. I've, not, and maybe not Carnegie. He's my council person. But um, the uh, all of them. I try, but. You never get any response. We need software to show. We have a website. It's very simple. It shows your tax history. It shows everyone's. Uh, you can compare against the mayor. You can compare Maliotakis and the mayor. You can compare them. And it shows very graphically what's happening. Go on the Department of uh, Finance website and try to find your tax history, your payment history. It looks like an accounting worksheet.
Mm-hmm. It, it's got, uh, us, you know, the, it, 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 it's, it's almost impossible. We do it graphically, and we give the, da- the information, and so you can put it into a spreadsheet. You can look at your name. You can, oh, all that stuff, you know. So I would love to help because we need a, a um, what's it called, a hackathon about, because if you go to the department's website, Department of Finance website, the assessment role is hidden deep into the website, and it's hidden inside an access database, which you have to, no one even uses Microsoft Access anymore. You have to extract it out, and I took that whole thing and put it into a real database and made it accessible to everyone, and nobody cares. It's sad. Anyway, thank you very much thank for coming you. in. I appreciate your testimony. You are doing something by being here today and giving testimony. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, thank you to this thank panel. You. Thank you. Okay, we were joined by Councilmember Kumbo oh, yeah. and Councilmember Gibson as well. So and I believe uh, with that, this meeting is adjourned at uh, 1224 in, in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. I never changed the clock. It's 11. Oh, excuse me.